So I will say that Rong, I'm going to introduce in a second. These are all very hardworking journalists, and Rong was filing until just about five minutes ago, ah, just now. And she also files 2,000 words every day. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And then after that, she comes here and talks with us. So um, the journalists you're about to hear from, I had the opportunity to meet all of you except for Orhan or cross paths in some way about 15 years ago when I was covering immigration in the city. And all of you have been working on these issues and collaborating in different ways for many years. Um, Rong is a reporter for Sing Tao, which is a Chinese daily in New York. What's the circul, do you have any idea of the circulation or reach? Well, I guess that's a commercial. Sure, your mic. A commercial secret, is it? <laughs> no, it's, I, I think uh, they said it's 50, Thousand, yeah, fifty thousand in the uh, New York area, I think. A day. A day, yeah. A day. Because we're a daily newspaper, so that's the readership. So I met Rong when I had first moved to New York. I was covering immigration, just like a mile maybe less from Chinatown. But for me, as a new reporter in New York, I really did not know much about Chinatown. And there was a service at the time called Voices That Must Be Heard that aggregated and translated ethnic media. It's now Voices of New York. And if you're interested in knowing about stories of immigrants in New York, it's a great resource. But I, um, I saw Rong's byline, and I emailed her. And she responded and helped me out with stories. Now, I like to think that I also credited you and linked, which I think is a very simple thing that reporters can do if you're working with someone, at the very least, link to the story where you got it from. Because that really doesn't happen. Well, tell me, how often does it happen? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's not that often. But Danila must have done something right, because I remember that was a pleasant memory. So, um, yeah. <laughs> um, but I wanted to ask you, because I think there is I don't know if I'm causing that. I think there is this, um, how do we do working together as journalists in a way that's not extractive, that's not a fixer relationship, but where you, as a reporter for Sing Tao, get something out of it as well as I do? I guess, you know, first of all, you have to be mutual respect um, and don't, it often happened that ethnic media would be treated as a sideline in this kind of a relationship. Uh, and I can tell you, reporters from ethnic media outlets are kind of uh, sensitive on this. Um, you know, if we work together, I wish we could uh, uh, discuss uh, issues on a professional way and as we are equal partners rather than I'm serving you. Um, so that's one thing. And another thing is, uh, um, because a lot of things happen, especially with a daily newspaper, things are constantly changing. Um, and also with breaking news, um, you know, it's not like all collaboration happen in a way that we, oh, let's sit down to plan a project uh, that we can have you and me working on a project for a few months or something like that. What happened was, it often happened, uh, was like this. Suddenly in Chinatown, there's a big uh, murder, like a whole immigration family uh, are uh, uh, kind of like uh, killed by some strange guy. And when things like this happened, uh, mainstream media reporters are often there as well, and we're there. So we could just hook it up at the, at the scene. Um, and then, you know, from there, you probably have a better uh, connection with the police people um, you get more information from them, and we have a deeper root in the community, and so we get some more like personal stories in our community, and we can combine. So uh, I think this does is that happen? Sometimes it happens, but it's not in a big scale. You know, like people like us are um, kind of like counterparts in the mainstream. Are people like Daily News or the New York Post? Sometimes we do at the scene the reporters uh, decided that we can exchange some information. But this often happened with smaller, it's better 
uh, chances to happen with the smaller mainstream media outlets rather than the big ones. I, I do have this um, experience of uh, uh, some kind of like collaborative work almost happened with a big name newspaper. I won't name them, but um, so what happened uh, later was like uh, they kind of like treated us as competitors. <laughs> At the same time, they wanted our help. So so it's like they were trying to get information from, from us, but they kind of like guarded their own, the you know, the sources or, so we, we you know, we figured, we tested that, we, we felt it. And then so the whole, um, whole thing just uh, collapsed. Can you tell me about, in contrast to that, what it was like for you, I know you worked recently on a massage with sex favors story um, that worked out better. Yeah, um, this, uh, this was, uh, this happened just the earlier this year. Uh, there was a massage girl jumped out of uh, at the window of the third floor um, uh, of her massage parlor during a police operation. Um, so she was, uh, you know, we, we thought she probably was trying to to run away from the police because she had some immigration issues. She didn't want to be arrested. Um, but, you know, some other people argued she probably committed suicide. Um, but anyway, so we... We did that story first, and then I translate. I, I helped uh, uh, Voices of New York to translate good stories from the Chinese uh, media outlets. So I translated that story, and then in Justice Today, probably saw the story on that website, the English version. So they contacted me at first. Um, so in, in Justice Today, uh, just for you know, their uh, online um, news website focusing on police conduct and uh, on the justice system. So they contacted me, and at first they wanted me to be an inter interpreter, and I said, okay. Uh, but then during the process, uh, I, I helped them to translate their interview uh, record and uh, a lot of the material. But during the process, I found that during their interviews, there are a lot of uh, questions they didn't ask, or probably they asked the answer that came out, because these people, we're talking about the family members of this um, uh, this ma uh, masseuse. They didn't speak Eng English at all. So d when they were there, I was not there. The the reporters from Injustice Today they only s spoke uh, they only speak English. So they used some kind of like online translation um, app, uh, and there was a, a community leader there to help them as well. But the community leader didn't speak very very well English, very good English either. So what, what happened was the reporters did ask some good questions, but the answers came up was, it didn't really kind of answer those questions, but they didn't know, the reporters did, didn't know. So during the process when I translated this, uh, um, uh, this transcript, and I found, oh, we need to know a lot of uh, stuff. Um, so I kind of like helped them to start to interview these um, family members. Um, and so, and also I gave them some suggestions from our culture perspective, like how should we approach them? What kind of questions should we ask? Uh, and if they answer your question in this way, what, that, what does this answer indicate? Because a lot of times you have to read between the lines. So um, I guess they probably feel it's very kind of like helpful. So. They voluntarily gave me a, a contributor's byline um, at the end. Uh, for us, we also benefited from this um, because at first when we approached the story, we, uh, we read it, we covered it just as some, oh, this poor girl um, immigrant and she was struggling to make her ends meet and then she jumped out of the, the window to her death. But then, while I was working with the reporters from Injustice Today, they were approaching the story from police misconduct, that perspective. So it turned out there were something fishy during, during the lifetime of this girl um, when she worked as a masseuse. For, she, she worked for probably a few years before she died. Um, she was bullied by some undercover cop. And she was uh, kind of like, to provide the 
free sex to undercover cops. So we thought, okay, probably you know we should expand our perspective and we should do uh, follow up the stories from from a different angle. So we're kind of like broadening our uh, vision as well. Thank you, Ron. Can I ask the panelists to turn off your lav mics? Because they're doing a little bit of. Oh, they're going to turn them. Oh, you're back. Got it. Got it. Um, so Karen Frillman is the executive editor of WNYC's Narrative Unit. If there's a podcast that you love right now coming out of WNYC, I think Karen's hand probably has something to do with it. Um, she is an amazing editor at WNYC, and I had the opportunity of working with her um, when I came in to fill in as the immigration reporter after I left doing it at the New York Sun. And when I started there, she told me I had to listen to this piece. Um, and she presented me with this Feet in Two Worlds CD of stories about New York. And I wanted, I was hoping you could start by just telling us a little bit about what was that CD and how did that experience with Feet in Two Worlds mark a change in your approach? Well, Feet in Two Worlds was started by a, a radio journalist um, who uh, wanted to begin to teach reporters who were working in the ethnic press how to do public radio. Public radio for a long time, we've wrung our hands that you know we just can't find people from outside the usual sources to report for us. And that's been the excuse um, and the reason that uh, a lot of the talent and a lot of the people that you hear on air um, do not come from and do not necessarily reflect um, the diversity that exists in the US. And so John Rudolph, who started Feet in Two Worlds, uh, began to make contacts in the ethnic press and raise money and came to me. I was at the editor of the newsroom at the time um, and said, can we collaborate? And I said, yes. And so we found a group of stories um, that, and, and they were mostly soft stories. And I think this is, when you talk about collaboration, the, the, in terms of the kind of entry level, we didn't start with investigative work in this case. Um, and so one of the stories was uh, from a reporter from the Polish Daily News who was talking about the pharmacies in Williamsburg and how the pharmacies in Brooklyn, in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, really functioned as social centers and information centers, and the much and and people would go in for diagnoses, and the pharmacist would give them medication, not prescription medication, in a lot of times homeopathic medication, but they had a very different relationship with these pharmacies, and so we did that story. We did a story about these video centers that are all over the city where people can speak, uh, set up a, speak on video to their relatives in Mexico or in El Salvador and can basically see each other. And um, families who have been separated for years can see their children who they ha in many cases haven't seen for as long as they've been here. Which is amazing to think of now. I always think of that story because it was such a radical breakthrough that you could actually see. And right. now it's the technology has shifted so much since then. That's right. The technology has changed. But at that time, there was no FaceTime. No, uh, this, this, I think that we did this series in, oh, I want to say maybe 2006. Um, and so, uh, and we, I had worked with Frank McCourt um, at one point in, when I was working in publishing. And so he, his, we sort of asked him as, um, not as an ethnic journalist, but as somebody who had written a nonfiction memoir about the struggle to live in two places, to have an identity that was based in, in Ireland as well as being an American and what that was like and his, his personal life and the life of his family. Um, and in, so in the course of doing that, we, um, we just got into neighborhoods and, and, and told stories that gave our listeners insight into the city that they walk around in every day 
and stories they don't see they're in, that are really in plain sight. You've done many collaborations as a station. Is there anything that's different about doing collaborations with ethnic media reporters? Well, because we work in radio, um, you have to translate your work to a radio report. And so there's that lift. If, if people have not worked in, if you're familiar with public radio, it ha it's pretty formatted. There's a very particular style, um, for better or worse, I would say. Uh, but if you're going to run on Morning Edition or All Things Considered, which is where all of our pieces run, you're going to ha it's going to have to, you know, be in that flow. And so accents are an issue. Language is an issue. And so um, make it, and just being able to get a story over on the air, present a story in that way, gather tape, use a tape recorder. Um, so there's, I mean, I think that is um, part of the collaboration, but we have been invested in if the story is right and if we want to do it, um, we do it. And in the case of this uh, Polish reporter who was working with the Polish Daily News, the next piece we did with her was an investigation as we were looking at the anniversaries um, of 9-11, which we, I mean, essentially in New York, we sort of documented the first 10 anniversaries because it was such a major story. So every year we said, what story are we going to do? And in this case, um, Eva pitched a story about the Polish workers who were in the union that dealt with asbestos. There's a very specific union that um, does that cleanup. And it's a lot of the workers in it are Polish. Some of them were undocumented had worked on the pile, had never been part of the health care that had gone to everybody that had been part of that. And so we really broke a story which won awards and to some extent brought, shed a light on these workers. Um, and so that was, we sort of grew into that work with her, you know, um, and uh, started with something that was easier and then moved. So you sort of have to, you have to pick the right stories because it's in we we want we want to be successful, you know. We want the reporter to be successful, and we want our listeners to have a, an, an interesting experience. Thank you, um, Oni or Anthony Advincula. Um, most recently was the editor and national media outreach coordinator at New America Media. And I think I probably crossed paths with you first also when you were at the Independent Press Association of New York and we're doing the translations and working on the aggregation, curation, connecting with ethnic media across the city for voices that must be heard. Most recently with New America Media, and New America Media, for those of you who don't know, worked on a national level for the past 45 years at, to work with ethnic media across the country. Um, and they had to close for financial reasons last fall, which was, a which was a loss for collaborations in working with ethnic media. Um, the last collaboration you worked on with, with New America Media was Voting Block, which was housed right here. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how Voting Block worked and what your role was? So my role in that project is a little bit quirky. You know, I'm the coordinator, I'm the facilitator, I'm part editor, um, I'm part crisis management person between the collaborators, and which is really a key. Um, so Voting Block is uh, a project between five ethnic media and a bunch of uh, mainstream, including WNYC, to report on uh, the gubernatorial elections here in New Jersey, the most recent one. So the most important for me, uh, assuming that role, is to identify the collaborators. We did not choose Iran or wrong because we like them. You know, first the uh, right the, the 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 issue itself, it, right? So you have to look at it like, how does that impact? a particular community, how many 
how many Turkish Americans are there in New Jersey? Is it big? How many Asian Americans, including Chinese and Filipinos, are in New Jersey? These are some of the qualifications when we chose uh, the collaborators. And then also, um, the other key here is everybody should be on the same page. Like what Rong was saying, the idea that an ethnic media reporter would come up is very different from what actually the mainstream collaborator would like to do. That's not gonna work. So um, when we flesh out the ideas, I talk to most of them, wrong to Oran and three others. What are those story ideas? And so we have to look at it as not just something that um, relevant to the audiences that they serve, but also relevant to the, the general market in, in a larger community. And I asked them to write it in their own language. And the reason for that is because they know their own community. And the language itself, you know, it's powerful when, 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 you, when you have that command for that language. So they wrote it uh, in their own language. And then I asked them also to translate it. We did not hire translators. If you hire a translator, and this is my experience, some of the nuances there are missed or, or you're not gonna see it because the translator itself, especially if the translator is not coming from that community, you know, the trajectory is kind of like very general, very mainstream, very broad. In order for that to be effective, I asked them to translate that in, into English. And then it did not stop there. We had to work on a daily basis to really edit it. So I edited it, came back to Iran and, and wrong. Here's the story. What are the missing here? Are, are the dots being linked? And I found out that sometimes if you generalize the idea, like I, this happens to me all the time. If I write for a Filipino publication, I Filipinize it, right? The same story idea that I wrote for the Jersey Journal before, exactly the same story idea, but there's a, a really big background information that needs to be done. Like how many Filipino Americans, in, in Ron's case, I ask him, how many Turkish Americans are there? The general audiences would love to know because this is about elections. Are they voting bloc? Could this, can they be considered voting bloc? And this happened after uh, the ban, the Muslim ban, um, Trump did. And also in the story, I remember this, we talked about this around, uh, it was done um, over dinner. Like, what were they eating? You know, it, it, it gives an anthropological perspective that the general audience or general market would like to know. That the translator would probably, oh, this is not going to work. This is too long already. This is not relevant. I'll just delete it, right, or edit it out. And then at the same time, you know, you go back to the, the mainstream collaborator in a way that is the story is already written in a way that is attractive to them. I mean, attractive is, I don't like to use that word, but some somehow follows the rules, right, that, that, that they do follow. So now it becomes generalized, but somehow did not you know, uh, miss out on a lot of the information that the original story. If you look at it, then there are two stories. The, the version of the, the Turkish and the Chinese, somehow different, but the same concept. You, you know, that, that concept is not altered. And then when you read the, the English, if you completely do a, a Google Translate, it will not be the same. That's where the interpretation comes in. I think I have to stop that there. <laughs> Come back to you on that in a second. Um, Orhan, can you tell us a little about yourself and also about Zaman America 
the newspaper that you report for here? Uh, I used to work for the Zaman America. I, I, right now I am working for the Zaman America as a volunteer. Uh, we have been struggling uh, uh, since uh, March 2016 after the government seized our company in Turkey, headquarter company in Turkey in Istanbul. Uh, we had the financial uh, struggle. Uh, we started struggle at that time actually. So after the coup attempt in 2016, uh, July 2016, uh, we had to shut down our newspaper because the, after the government uh, closed down the, our newspaper headquarters, uh, it's caused, uh, it's affected us financially. Uh, we were dependent uh, on financially to headquarters. Uh, back in 2016, uh, we were four reporters and one editor. And right now, uh, nobody's working for the Zaman America anymore, unfortunately. Uh, they have to, the, the reporters and the, the editor is doing another job and because they had to find another job to live in the United States. Uh, so we were the biggest newspaper in Turkey, so right now we shut down everything. So it's sad. Um, but right now we had a website so far. We are trying to keep it alive. Uh, so we had the uh, collaborative uh, articles. We have been in contact with you and with Oni and uh, with Stephanie uh, a few times. So uh, trying to keep the Turkish community here alive uh, to give them the news actually. So after the quit attempt, I just would like to summarize it fast, uh, after the quit attempt, uh, 319 journalists has been arrested in Turkey. Uh, so more than 180 outlets, media outlets had shut down uh, by the government. So uh, thank God I live here, thank God I am doing uh, journalism here. I'm trying to uh, keep my uh, work here. Uh, even our Twitter account, have, uh, with health in Turkey, we cannot tweet anything against the Turkey. So our situation uh, right now is uh, as, as, as I, ex I, I expressed, so. In contrast to I mean, such a stark situation, such <laughs> a dire situation in Turkey, I am curious, did this opportunity to collaborate here, what did this mean to you? How did it impact? your trajectory? Yeah. Uh, first of all, we had a chance to keep continue communicate with Turkish community here. Uh, without this uh, project, I don't think uh, I would ask any Turkish uh, community and Turkish people about the government election, local election. So when I uh, we got this project and when they uh, the only called me and uh, we got this project we started the project I was uh, looking for some Turkish who is uh, who is uh, interested in political and politic in a local election so I found them I met with them uh, I met with them a few times I had with them the dinner uh, so uh, I talked them about the politics and the government election. So it was good, it was actually great. They were very happy because they, uh, not in Turkish, and we translated in English and we write it down in English again. So it's separate. Uh, I just saw the article in, even in another website. So, uh, which is, they were surprised when they saw their picture in another website, which was uh, great. Um, uh, for me, it was good experience. Uh, even not the just language, of course. Uh, most of the time, we spend our time to spend uh, writing in Turkish, not in English. With this project and that kind of project, we have chance to write in English and to see how it's come out uh, in English website. So we reach the uh, more audience, more uh, expanded our platform. So Turkish people had the chance to uh, to make uh, to pay attention to I mean the local and some English 
uh, website as well. So I think now is a good time to see if there are questions and to include everyone in this discussion. So if anyone in the audience has questions here, we're going to start with folks who are here and might have a question um, for the panel or for Daniela. So who would like to start? Who wants to start? Over here. Eve Oppenheim with a freelancer. I uh, just wondered, what, what do you have to do to protect your sources, and is it any different from any other kind of media coverage? Um, to protect your sources as an ethnic media reporter or as in a collaboration? Uh, I would think um, um, <coughs> perhaps some uh, kind of like the standard or the protocol at our place um, is a little different from um, the mainstream media. For example, we don't always require you to have a full name and the age. Um, this really helpful. This is really helpful uh, in cases like you're dealing with some sensitive news. Um, so we don't have that pressure at all. Um, but, you know, sometimes when I work as a freelancer for the English language media uh, or, you know, as a collaborator with the mainstream media, I do feel I had that pressure. No matter what the story is, they always want a full name and an age. Uh, uh, to be honest, right now we are, uh, I mean, we have some Turkish people, they escape from the Turkey uh, because uh, many of you, you know what's happening right now in Turkey. Uh, when we write the articles about any community, so they don't give their name, even they don't give their what they live. So when I was running one story for the Voice of New York, so they ask me, don't, uh, you don't, uh, if you want, you cannot give their exactly name. You can uh, just write another name, but the story should be the same. I mean, uh, for uh, the story should be 100% true, but the name you can, I mean, just uh, change their name because of their security. So that's very important for them. Why? Because they have relatives in, in Turkey, so they cannot, take any risk. Another question. I have a question for the group too while I'm walking over here. One of the things that um, we think a lot about, and I admit I'm not good at, and I know some of the editors we work with in the mainstream media aren't good at, is thinking through what's an equitable partnership, um, which is very different than even just being equals at the table. Um, what tips would you have that we could help give to editors at mainstream um, American publications when they're thinking through how to partner with ethnic media in a way that is equitable for you and, and for them, but for you, because a lot of times that doesn't happen. You know, even just a simple byline, um, you know, for every reporter, right, whether you're an ethnic media reporter or a general mainstream media reporter, a byline somehow gives you that confidence, right, that you've done that work. Uh, we, we've worked with a top dog publication, all of you have read, um, and it, it failed because uh, the editors were just like getting the story ideas from the ethnic media, and there was not even a byline, you know, not even a tagline at the, at the bottom, like, you know, a so and so contributed to this reporting at least you know so then that's not fair uh, to begin with the other one is again is to really talk about be in sync like Rong was saying about earlier different story idea you can't do that because then you get you make the the ethnic media reporter blindsided what you're actually going to do and also proper attribution if you get it from the ethnic media then say it, you know, according to Turkish or Saman America, there are so-and-so. I mean, why can't that be, 
you know, uh, complicated. Um, so little things like that really help. And I think working in, I mean, we know in radio when, like, we put our reporting out there and sometimes newspapers pick it up and don't give us credit. So we are a little bit sensitive about that because, you know, we'll pick up the New York Times and it's like, we had that story and there's no mention of our reporting and they've re-reported it or whatever. So we have come to a point where for us, we want our story out there. I mean, so we want to be on your site. We want you on our site. I mean, our goal is to get the word out there. We, I think we have, we're not saying that we don't, we, when we break a story, we certainly want to break it, but we don't want to take somebody else's breaking story. And so our goal is to get it out. So we, when we collaborate, if we're collaborating with ProPublica or the Marshall Project um, or Feet in Two Worlds, everything gets posted everywhere and, um, and people get credited. As, I mean, that's our goal. I mean, one question to build on that that I had for Rong um, when we were talking about this before is, so say, so for instance, for Feet in Two Worlds, one of the reporters who worked on it got hired by WNYC right away. Now, the, that benefited the reporter and he was very happy about it, but did it hurt the publication where he was before? And I thought you had an interesting answer to that, one that had to do with visas, which was that most people wouldn't leave, had something to do with immigration visas, but then also that for you personally, being able to do both actually keeps you at Sing Tao because it enriches your career. Yeah, uh, I'm an example that um, I didn't leave. I have been working for Sing Tao for more than 15 years, although I've done um, a lot of um, um, collaborative or freelance works for the mainstream media or English language media as well. Um, I think uh, one of the problems, the challenges uh, reporters, journalists working for at the media is there aren't so many opportunities. We write for our own newspaper in a different language that most of the people in this country don't understand. Um, and the impact that we can make is only so much. Um, so this is the very reason that now we're seeing a lot of young talents. They joined our industry and then they leave very quickly because they, they don't see hope, they don't see the future. Um, I think my experience is while you do freelance work for English language media or um, collaborative, whatever you call it, um, you feel like you are fulfilling your journalism dream. Uh, I, my, some, some of my stories did make changes um, after it was published by an English publication. And the first story I did for New York Daily News, that was about some people in Chinatown, small businesses in Chinatown, was um, cheated by a utility company based in Canada. Um, that was, when I, before I did that for the Daily News, I did several pieces for Singtel on that issue. Nothing changed. The company in Canada didn't care at all. When I say, hey, I'm a reporter from Singtel Daily, they would say, what? You know, what's Singtel Daily? And then when I told them, now I'm doing the story for the New York Daily News, guess what? God, it's so different. They immediately called me back saying, we're forming this committee particularly to investigate on this issue. And then uh, after the story was published, all of those people who were cheated were refunded. So, you know, now, you know, that's the reason that I stay um, at Singtel because I feel even if I stay within at the media, I'm, I'm making change. I'm doing things that I want to do. Hi, I'm Uriah Kaiser here with Lion Publishers, and the protecting your sources story, um, the question, I wanted to go sort of go the other way with it. So do you have any sort of best practices that you can talk about when you're working with, um, you know, b another journalist, both of you bringing your own relationships and sources to the table, and maybe there's an instance where a, a part of the story is moving and the one reporter who has that source isn't available that day or is that a doctor's appointment with their children or whatever the reason may be? Uh, can you talk about some best practices that you have um, in, in managing the pieces of the story and how you work together on that? 
So I think it's, I mean, it's communication, right? And it's, it's just clear communication. Um, I'm not sure if anyone has any other insights or specific communication practices. It didn't come up in a report. I can say personally, if I'm working with someone else, if I'm working with Rong on something, and it's her source, I'm going to ask her before I approach the source. Um, I think that's that's what I would do. I'm, I'm assuming you would do the same. Yeah, of course. But most of the times, it's more like we are the one who provided sources. So, um, you know, it's rarely happened that I do need to approach a source that I get from a mainstream media. That's the very purpose that they come to us. And really, I mean, I think on some of these stories where sources are don't really want to come forward in those kinds of sensitive areas, we 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 rely on, you know, that reporter to help us do that. So it's it's really it's not beneficial for us to do it to continue to get the story. But as you know, as Danielle says, it's communication. It depends on how long. People have been reporting, and it's all circum. I would say it's it's each circumstance is different. Where, Orhan, did you want to? Just want to add one thing. When I we get this project, I ask some uh, Turkish people around me. Uh, I'm writing a uh, story about the election. Uh, one of the guy told me I I just get called actually from the New York Times uh, to ask me about the election. What do you think about the uh, election. So I asked him, what did you say? He said, uh, I didn't say anything. I said, why? He said, I don't trust him. I don't know him. So uh, I said, this is the New York Times. He said, I don't know him. Just he called me from the New York Times and asked me some questions. I asked him uh, if, I, if I'm going to ask you if uh, I'm going to write your name. He said, totally fine. Just uh, do it. But if I don't know any journalist, so I don't want to give any comment. So that's the ethnic media is the key role, I think. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, Oni, did you have another? Yeah, Michael so has. just real quick. Uh, while ethnic media, well, let me frame it this way. The biggest benefit that the mainstream media would get is accessibility, right, to sources from the ethnic communities. But please do not use that as, like, they are inside informants. They're not. They are collaborators. They know the they they know their communities, but they're not going to put their communities in a in a harm's way, right? And the other part there is you're actually going to benefit it because you will expedite the story rather than looking for your sources for six months. Wrong knows you know all the nail salons probably you know all those people who go for iftar dinner for like probably in two weeks. So, you know, budget-wise, you cut, you save money, you save time, and at the same time, you get the real source coming from the community. But please, they're not the mole, right? They, 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 they are from their community. They're the first responders of their community. Thanks, Oni. So we have a couple questions from Ground Source. So I'm gonna let Simon um, ask one of them, and then next we've got a question from Dave, and up front with Jane. Um, so the first question is from Pat with WDET. Thanks, Pat. Um, a mainstream editor might have concerns about presenting an ethnic story because the mainstream audience might not, quote, get it or care about it. How would an editor who really wants to tell that story overcome that and make it something that the audience will like and want more of? Well, I always say I'm the first listener, you know, to a story, and I'm... Uh, so if I don't get it, then, you know, I'll say, all right, how do we, how do we get, how, you know, I'll, the reporter will say, no, 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 you, you have to understand. I mean, this is happening, uh, this happens all the time. Um, in a certain way, there's language, there's um, trends, there's slang, there's um, pop culture um, phenomenon in different communities. And so that's just storytelling and reporting. That's that's then finding a style of, of talking about it so it doesn't sound like exactly like you're explaining it to, you know, your mother or father, but you're, but th that's really the art of, 
of telling a good story so that, because you are broadcasting, we're broadcasting. We don't know who's going to tune in. I mean, we are transmitters on the Empire State Building, and it's a broadcasting network. So we have an obligation for clarity. Um, and so that's just then. But yet, it's great to introduce people to something they don't understand so that they're in the know. Um, and so that's really just finding the language, finding the storytelling, find, finding a style to get that, to get that over. Because we want our audience to be in the know. That's why we want people to come back because they've learned something new, you know. I mean, and and that's 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 a every every organization right now is trying to do that. Anyone anyone else on that question? Oh, I would just add just one line. Um, I think if if possible, maybe you really want to go through with us and um, you know have one of us to read it through before he publish because um the sensitivity spots of people are so complicated now um especially now and and you know even within the same community the chinese community you don't know how many times that i cover stories that the second generation and first generation fight against each other and people who are born in the u.s fight against the people newcomers from the mainland china so even one community is not um, just one person. You know, it's a diverse, every community is kind of diverse. So I, I, I kind of like, I do understand the feeling that you're worried about, um, you know, to touch the sensitivity taboo um, place. I, I think really like uh, it's good to be careful and to go through someone who are insider of the community. Great. We have a question. I, I'm struck with equity, the idea of equity. And I, I see how you can get a greater access if you can say you're also reporting this for the New York Daily News. But I also know there's, um, even though uh, the mainstream media may bemoan uh, their economic uh, fortunes, it's still comparing apples to apple orchards. <laughs> in terms of uh, many e uh, ethnic media positions. So have any of you worked with a nonprofit that in terms of equity afterward would uh, consider writing you into a grant or consider helping you with a grant that could, um, could help fund you afterwards, you know, in, a, in, a, in another way? I, I think the compensation is, um, very much controlled by the most powerful partners sometimes. And I don't know, you know, um, Karen's shop has some very good grant writers, or they have other, you know, I don't know if that's ever happened. And Anthony or, or Rong, maybe you know. Yeah, I, would, I, I guess mine is different because when I work with No American Media, basically that's one of our backbone projects. So we provided uh, fellowships uh, to uh, ethnic media reporters to work on stories. In fact, the voting block, it came out of a fellowship. And sometimes it's not like a rigorous application type. We just cherry pick because we built these relationships with them. We know these people. We just cherry pick, okay, one would be an Arab reporter. The other one would be a Filipino reporter. So yes, and the the funders are they've been phenomenally helpful about this, and there are so many stories that they would have not had that opportunity to report on if not for that fellowship. The, the equity equitable equity question is a large one, and it's something we saw also even within the same company, right? So if you look at the, how much reporters make at OI for instance, versus the LA Times or LD versus Dallas Morning News. And um, it was brought up as well, this question of how can you fund these initiatives in a way that people are being compensated more equally for their work? Um, the fellowship model is one. I'm not sure if you have ideas for others. Yeah, I, you know, I have to tell you, not only that we don't make uh, as much as the mainstream media journalists, um, the stories I do, 
the deeper ones, um, uh, thorough, investigative, or whatever you call it, I always use my own time because we have to do 2,000 words every day. And they can't, even if I have a long-term project, uh, they don't have the luxury to offer me the time. So I kind of like donate my own time, my own vacation. I spend a lot of vacation days on my projects. So the fellowships are, and, uh, and grants as well are very, very important. That's why when New American Media fell, we were so sad because they were at that time the only one that do national, nationwide kind of uh, fellowships. Now you have CUNY CCEM. Um, they, are, they are offering some kind of fellowships as well. And Sandy Close from New American Media is still doing some type of services uh, under a new brand called uh, Ethnic Media Service, but um, in a much smaller scale. So basically right now, there is no nationwide uh, um, organizations that will offer such opportunities. Uh, I mean, my I've been in Sindao for 15 years. I have basically uh, done all those fellowships that's open to ethnic media. But the young reporters and the newcomers, they they don't have opportunities anymore. And it seems like the the future is is even narrower and narrower. And that's a very depressing scene that we're seeing now. Uh, well, I wanted to, I think we're getting late in the evening, but I just wanted to make a couple of comments. My name is Jane Regan, and I've worked in the U.S. in community media, but also I spent many years in Haiti. And when you talk about the so-called ethnic media and the parachuting slash faux collaboration or whatever, I would call it more extractive work that the mainstream media does with your outlets, it reminds me a lot of Haiti where you're working there every day for how many years in a row, and then somebody parachutes in from the LA Times and the New York Times. So I just want to make a couple of comments and also make a pledge for us to not feel depressed, but to feel strong. Because what we're calling the so-called ethnic media is you're the media of what is soon to be the majority in this country. And in fact, I think that one thing we should do going forward is to eliminate that term, ethnic media. I'm Anglo slash Irish, American, whatever. That's an ethnicity. That's an ethnic. We all have an ethnicity. Why is why is the Sing Tao Daily an ethnic media and the New York Times isn't? So that's one of my little things I wanted to say. The other thing is um, I wanted to say that um, this whole idea of this extraction and this gaining of accessibility through your hard work and your existing in a community. There's no way you all and all of people working for the outlets you work for, there's no way you can really form some kind of a union. But again, I think that fighting against the term fixer and saying you demand double byline, period. Because they wouldn't get the access without, and they wouldn't get the, the authenticity without your collaboration, whether it's as an individual or as a media outlet. Again, can you form a union? Can you make a rule? No. But can you talk to your pals when you go out for tea or dinner or beers or whatever? Yes. When I was in Haiti, I was one of several fixers. I was the only non-Haitian fixer, alleged fixer, because I rarely did it. But I did it once in a while. I did it for the Village Voice, because I thought that they were worth it. But I refused to let them use that term. And we would not let people use the term. We said, call, call, just call me my name. And then I want a byline. Is it a double byline? Is it what uh, what you said, Anthony, like a name at the end of the article? I don't care. But it's got to be fair. And um, I think that that's a start of, the, of something to go forward. The idea is to have impact on this country and on the planet and to change things and to keep working for progressive social change. And we got to stick up for ourselves while we're sticking up for all these communities that we're reporting on. And the last uh, thing that I would say is there's actually a thing in scholarship called native reporting. And it's this kind of scholarship, PhD level recognition of what those of you who live in these communities and work in these communities, whether you work as taxi drivers or you're making crepes or you're harvesting bananas or you're reporters, you have something that the New York Times and the Fox News or whoever, or BBC, they don't have. 
And so it's just a matter, I think, of at the same time as we're working for progressive social change in our communities and our own media outlets, we, you got to stick up for yourselves as individuals. What really surprises me about a lot of journalists, especially investigative journalists, you're, we're all excellent at sticking up for others, and sometimes we sort of don't have much left to stick up for ourselves. But it kind of goes part and parcel with the same thing if we're going to survive. So I just want to salute everyone for all the work you've done so far to helping make the world and this country, too, a better place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions from the audience now? And Simon, where did you go? I think we have another question from Ground Yes, Sir. we do. <laughs> Just magically appear out of nowhere. I'm going around the circle all the time. Do you, I think, uh, this is from Tara George, who's a professor here. Thanks, Tara. Uh, do ethnic media reporters often face greater risks in their reporting than their mainstream media collaborators? Of course. Um, I'll speak up too. Do ethnic media reporters often gr face greater risks in their reporting than their mainstream media collaborators? I think what's challenging about that question is that ethnic media is such a diverse um, group. And so I could imagine that certain groups do, but I don't know that we could say that ethnic media overall faces greater risks. I, I think that's definitely the case. Because first of all, you don't have a, a good insurance, you know, as good as the main, your mainstream colleagues. And secondly, uh, and all these sorts of other protections like libel and this and that, you know, in our newspaper, we have to be responsible for ourselves. If we got into trouble, that's nobody really protect us. That's we have to face the legal lawsuits or something like that. Well, uh, you know, legal lawsuits aside, um, even during daily work, like if we make phone calls to say uh, the, the mayor's office or um, some big shots and asking for comments, they won't reply. They won't like, we don't know your newspaper, you know, I'm, I'm, if I'm the um, press person, my boss don't read your newspaper, so why should I bother to work with you? So we have to be very persistent, and we have to may maybe like make a hundred phone calls like that two people, only two people call you back. So yeah, it is a much tougher life. As an ethnic media member, of course, uh, you have so many pressure from the community like uh, our our just revenue is from the advertisement the like the i am talking about uh, our publication uh, we are in, in in turkish so we should get the advertisement in turkish from the turkish businessman so if you have any chance to reach out to all of them so to get the good advertisement so which is good for the our website uh, which, which is good for our revenue but other, uh, on the other hand, we have uh, another problems, uh, as the, my Francis just mentioned, uh, we are by our own because we should pay our uh, all legal fee, as she said, if we have any problems. Uh, we have to pay our health care insurance as well. So that's why we are, I mean, so different from the mainstream media as well. And when the, we are in New York, we have the Daily News, we have the New York Times, we have the Wall Street Journal, who cares about your publications? So even uh, they don't care about your publications until you publish your articles in mainstream media, so. Also makes me think of something that Oni and Sandy used to do um, frequently, to Ron's point, is to help organizing fellowships that provided access to decision makers because sometimes going together in a partnership or even with a mainstream media organization, I know, made a difference. We had something in Atlantic City here in New Jersey, I remember, that you helped organize that, help that. And I think it depends on the community. The smaller the community, the harder actually it is because like what he was saying, the business depends on that community. If you 
say something bad about a business person there who's sort of influential, then the one that's going to suffer is your publication, right? Because it's it's a smaller. But for the Chinese community, I think that would be a different scenario because it's, it's a larger population, especially in the New York City area. Great. I think we're, we're just about ready to wrap up. We're just a little bit over time. Um, are there any final questions before any final comments from the panel? You're right in the middle, of course. <laughs> Uh, my name is Jason Cowan from Stuyvesant High School. My question is, many journalists I know devote their lives to informing others for the general good of their communities or, or general populace. How does this broad mission vary between smaller ethnic media journalists and mainstream journalists? So do you want to speak to how the mission you feel like, well, what do you feel like the mission of Singtao is? Um, I think uh, in terms um, of that, we probably are uh, having a, we're more um, responsible to uh, kind of like help our community to, you know, to bigger good or, you know, to, because we have to provide them the, the information. And a lot of our readers are new immigrants. They know nothing about this country. We have to help them get through the process of, uh, kind of like assimilate into this country. Um, and uh, after a generation of uh, readers have already done that, they melt into the so-called mainstream, they would uh, no longer read us. You know, we're kind of, uh, because then after they can read English, they'll get their inf information from the English language uh, media. And then we'll go back to start to kind of like serve the new come, the new wave of uh, new immigrants. So I feel sometimes we're like a um, boat person, you know, like like to help them again and again, and only to help them to leave us, not to keep them. Um, and also another note is, um, Danella, you mentioned uh, uh, advocacy media and, and you know, um, I'm thinking sometimes, it, any media, your responsibility is to serve your readers. And this reader group sometimes is uh, defined by uh, ethnicity, like us. But some other times, it, it's defined by geography. You know, so I was thinking, the New York Daily News and New York Post would uh, um, advocate for New Yorkers anyway. So when you see their, read their stories, say if there's a big... Uh, uh, train or airplane accident happened in London, the New York Post and New York Daily News would definitely focus on any New Yorkers who died or injured in that, in that um, accident. What we do is no different. It's just like because our readers are Chinese language readers, so we have to serve their benefits, their interests, and we have to always focus on them. And I, I would just say, that having worked with a, a lot of different journalists, I think that's really, I think there are certain journalists who feel a calling to actually do their work in a certain way and to say, I want this story to really get under somebody's skin. I want somebody to read that story and not be able to stop thinking about it. I want somebody to understand what it's like to, um, you know, uh, come into New York with $5 in their pocket or the fear of deportation or whatever the story is. And I think, so I, I, and I think that happens within the ethnic press and I think that happens within the mainstream press and I think you really see it when you, you'll, you, you as you, I don't know how many people here are journalism students, but that's, I mean, this is an individual choice and it is those people who work on their vacations and who work at night and who work those extra hours to make the, to find that edge of the story that really brings in the humanity of it cuz that cuz that's what journalism can do i mean it can be transformative you can change people's minds with a story but not everybody practices it that way in any in any medium and you know that's it can be done it's a challenge 
But I, I just think in a way that's an ind that's individual journalists who take that on. I think the story that your question, if you look at it, it's whether we are biased, you know, because the question is, how are we different, you know, in terms of our reporting? Um, the perspective of the story is always through the lens of the community, right? The stories that they produce or we produce, it's news that these people can use, new immigrants, immigrants, you know, people of color. That's the perspective of the story. But I don't think it's biased. You, you may call it slanted or biased, but the way we see it, it's not. I see the back door of that question, which is very important. But what Rong was saying was, um, like the New York Post, they look for New Yorker passengers and they report about it. Same thing with ethnic media. You know, if there is a Chinese person who was, you know, part of the bombing or a victim of the bombing, they're going to report it. You know, same thing with immigration. They're not going to write about, excuse me, about deportation, putting that, let's say, a Filipino family, you know, to feed it to the ICE. Of course, the, 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 the story's perspective would be, pro, you know, for that family, you know, facing deportation. So I, I think it's a, it's a matter of how you see it, uh, but I really like your question. I really do, it's, 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 it's so meaty. Just want to add uh, some example. Uh, the, it was a few a few weeks ago, uh, shooting in high school, Florida. So when we heard this news, of course we uh, saw the name and we how many victims there are. But we were looking for the Turkish student. Is there any Turkish student there? Because when we write the story through the Turkish people, through the Turkish. So uh, we are getting more attention because everyone is looking for their ethnicity. Uh, so when we look at it, we saw uh, we got two students in the school, but they didn't uh, get any hurt. So uh, as you said, it's everyone is looking for their people in community, in, in ethnic media. Let's give our panel a round of applause.